Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I see we have a big group tonight. Oh, let's call the meeting to order. Um, and the first item of the agenda is to um, uh, talk about the approval of the previous minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the previous minutes or do we have any proposed amendments? Not seen anyone. Deb, did you hear that? You just get on. Um, anyone have any proposed amendments? Last call under uh, the previous minutes. Otherwise, we will accept the minutes as submitted. Okay, let's do that. Um, so first order of business is we would like to welcome um, our new sustainability intern, um, June. Welcome to our group. Uh, I think you're on mute. Happens to everyone first couple of times for sure. I didn't know if I was supposed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, well, Kelly has just you know, told me a little bit about you. And I know you. there was a quick summary in the agenda, but um, Kelly, I don't know if you want to give a quick summary and then do you want to have June, you know, talk about his role here and, and why he, why he's on this, why he's doing this? Well, I'm really, well, I'm really pleased that June joined us. He'll be here for a couple months and he's primarily helping out with the major huge task of energy tracking as a city. Um, MGE now has a service for municipalities that are smaller to um, take all of our energy billing data and push it to Energy Star Portfolio, which is basically a platform which keeps track of all of our energy use and we can run reports from that. So hopefully our energy tracking will be much more transparent soon. And, and then um, he's also helping with Soul Smart designation, which is an initiative really led by the county and CARP-C to help align all the communities in Dane County to make solar as streamlined as possible for businesses and residents so that they know clearly how to do it, um, make it easy for them, take any kind of um, permit fees away, just basically streamline solar so that there's higher adoption. And then um, he's also helping with me with research and all sorts of things. So it's been really helpful so far. Thank you, June. Well, Kelly's got plenty to do. So um, I'm sure you are a huge resource to her. Well, would you Thank like to you. just, we're all very excited that you're on board. Um, would you just like to tell us a little bit about yourself and? Yeah, sure. So. I am a gap year student. Uh, I am taking a gap year before I go to college. I am from New Jersey and I moved to Windsor, Wisconsin in August with my father. And uh, a big reason why I took a gap year was so that I can explore environmental, the environmental field because I want to pursue a career that will help the environment, but really you can make any career in environmental career. So I'm a little overwhelmed. So I want to explore my options so that I can uh, have a better I idea of what I'd like to pursue before I go to college. That sounds and very smart. It is a big field and there's a lot to do. So um, very good approach. And I think I you're in so great, well, I know you're in great hands here with Kelly. Yes. And thank we look you. forward to interfacing with you, you know, throughout your time here. So thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kermit. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask between Kelly and June, uh, is your work with the coordination of the uh, energy data between the two systems to automate this process so that it'll be less painful going forward? Or are you just involved with getting it up to speed and then we're going to still have to get new staff or new interns to keep on shoveling the information around well it should really streamline it and make it simple to transfer the data um and we're working with the county they're helping us you have to kind of set it up on the back end before you start using it so that's what we're going through now and i think it's going well it's it's confusing until you get into the weeds in it and then you're like okay i think we know what to do 
Good question. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, thank you, June. Welcome. Let's move on to public comments. Um, who has public comments this evening? And if you could please limit your public comments to three minutes um, if you speak, that'd be great. Um, Kevin, you're up first, then Robert Owen. Okay, I'm bringing up my video here. I'm traveling here and I'm kind of balancing a, a laptop here on a couple of pillows. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, I uh, I communicated with each of you recently uh, in the last 24 hours about item number four tonight. And I just wanted to, to give a little background as to what I did uh, when this whole issue of putting artificial turf came up onto the new ball fields um many of us were concerned about the chemicals that are in the the uh the turf and that will be leaching out of the turf either from the turf itself or the uh garbage dump on, underneath um also we we're worried about microplastics uh that are, are not safe uh, for the watershed but also for the players that are on the turf and there's been an increasing amount of evidence over the last few years, whether it's from the University of Minnesota or Massachusetts or Norway, that uh, artificial turf is not safe um, from a health standpoint, if nothing else. And I think it's now pretty clear that it's also more prone to, to creating injuries. So what I did, I, I looked back through our comprehensive plan and also the sustainable city plan for uh, portions that were applicable to this. And there were sections in there, which, which I sent to each of you, uh, excerpts uh, where we treat water resources like a treasure, spend time and money to protect that treasure. We combat climate change. We need to be proactive. We seek to improve stormwater management practices so that, that, that they adequately mitigate intense rain events reduce runoff rates and volumes, reduce sediment and pollutant transport, and improve the quality of streams, ponds, wetlands, and Lake Mendota. We take actions to lessen the potential impact and increase flood peaks are likely to have on public safety and our infrastructure, as well as Pheasant Branch Conservancy. We protect, protect property with upstream flood control and nutrient reduction strategies to preserve restoration and redevelopment investments and reduce detrimental downstream effects from runoff. And more importantly, um, and more directly, I think, th these are aspirational goals that their city has had. We went looking uh, with, a, I had a lot of help from an intern we have, Owen Weiss uh, with 350.org or 350 Wisconsin. And we uh, found very little in the way of of city, uh, county, and state regulations as to what quality of water um, is regulated. Uh, believe it or not, there's uh, it's it seems like the law is silent on many of these things, and that's why I think they're having issues with the PFAS. But in our comprehensive plan, one of the recommended changes is to consider updating the city's stormwater runoff control and erosion control ordinances to maintain the highest feasible water quality and quality, quantity, I'm sorry, water quality and quantity control standards that factor in updated rainfall data, data and the best available technology. So there's a placeholder in the comprehensive plan to put these kinds of things in place and there's no uh, direct uh, prevention or my contacts I made at DNR and also within Dane County implied that the city could put its own controls on such uh, runoff issues. But I just wanted to make that clearer uh, and state that I think we have aspirational um, goals to uh, keep our water as clean as possible, as well as our, our uh, human bodies. So sorry, that was a bit of a rambling speech, but <laughs> thanks for your time. I appreciate everyone's effort on the committee. Thank you, Kevin. Robert. 
Uh, thank you. Good evening. My name is Robert Owen. I live at 1311 Middleton Street. My comments this evening relate to rezoning to accommodate the Middleton Boys and Girls Athletic Facilities at the high school. For reasons stated by Chair Pulvermacher in her letter to the MCP ASD School Board in February and some additional reasons relating to microplastic pollution and excessive runoff from plastic athletic fields, I think the city should allow rezoning only on condition that MCP ASD agree not to install artificial turf on the fields in question. But if the city is unwilling to go that far and contest the district's dubious preference for plastic athletic fields, it should at least require the district to design and operate them in a less polluting manner, which does not foster excessive runoff and heavy rains and unnecessary plastic pollution. Drainage from the boys' and girls' fields should go into retention ponds before entering pipes leading to the creek. The drainage should be should proceed across removable filter mats and silt traps before entering pipes. The fields themselves should be bermed all around with six inch high berms with a limited number of uh, uh, drainage gates, each preceded by a removable filter mat. The purpose of these measures is to keep microplastics on the field or in the filters, not in the creek. The plastic uh, ground, <clears throat> the plastic granular captured granulate captured from foot filters should be reapplied to the fields. When the fields no longer need plastic gran granulate, this should be treated as hazardous waste and returned to the uh, seller thereof or otherwise dealt with as hazardous. An alternative might be to use cork or coconut fiber in lieu of plastic granulate. Maintenance of the field and cleaning of maintenance equipment should be done in a manner to keep the plastics on the field. Likewise, player, players leaving the field should have a place to clean their spikes within the field berm enclosure. Uh, all of this is related to guidelines used by Gothenburg, Sweden uh, currently. Any dugout or structure or other uh, on or near, I should say, the old landfill should be designed to vent, not trap methane. That's a safety concern. Thank you for considering these comments. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so Robert, if you don't mind just lowering your hand when you have a chance. Um, so see no other public comments. Now, if you do have a public comment, additional ones, uh, let me know uh, now. Um, I was informed that uh, potentially we'd have reps here from the turf company. And if you are here, I don't know who you are. Um, and um, so just for, especially for the new members as well um, to the committee, normally when we, uh, you know, have public comments, we try to really only, only once we get to our discussion, only discuss things that are specifically on the agenda. So um, let's say tonight we had, um, you know, uh, so a public comment about something completely unrelated to anything tonight. We could not discuss that tonight because it's not on the agenda. However, in this case tonight, we've had two public comments on the turf and the turf is, uh, and the rezoning, uh, you know, recommendation is specifically on our agenda and we'll discuss that now. Um, so we can feel free to move forward and discuss the public comments we have. Um, so not seeing any other public comments in this format, let's move forward with uh, agenda item number four. Um, so who has, um, we can just start out with a general discussion. Who has comments, feedback, thoughts? What do you think? I can preface it by saying, um, kind of what's up for discussion tonight is essentially whether our committee uh, recommends that the city um, approve the rezoning request to rezone this area um, from conservancy, which it is now, to institutional um, zoning. Um, so right now the conservancy zoning does not allow for artificial turf. However, if the rezoning request is approved, uh, 
and it is um, rezoned to institutional, then the artificial turf will be allowed or would potentially be allowed. That's the way I understand it. Um, Dick. Okay, well, this seems like a really big issue and we've been dealing with it for a number of meetings. I'm really interested in hearing what the recommendations are from the Friends of Pheasant Branch Conservancy because it is conservancy lands that are being asked to rezone, be rezoned. So I think it would be really helpful to have some kind of update on how they, what their recommendations are about this whole thing. Deb, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yes, I just came from a Friends of Pheasant Branch meeting. And um, at that meeting, um, we voted to oppose the change in zoning designation because we are committed to uh, keeping conservancy lands or increasing conservancy lands and to, I guess to change the zoning, we would be decreasing conservancy lands because we would be taking it out of that zoning code. So that's that was the uh, recommendation from the friends. Can I follow up with that question? Because I asked them. Yes. Yes. Um, any concerns about the environmental impacts to conservancy lands and waters from that would happen if it was rezoned and an artificial turf surface were put up? Um, discussion was that um, we, the friends, don't have the expertise. Uh, and also the microplastics are not regulated at this point in time. There's not a, an amount uh, that's deemed dangerous. And so um, we, we're, we're just going to go based on the um, conservancy land designation. We want to keep it that way. Okay, thank you. Kermit? Um, oh, I thought somebody else was ahead of me. Or did you take your hand down? Yeah, I was just going to ask the same thing that um, Dick asked. So, okay. So, yeah, Kermit okay. can go. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess from my review of the materials and particularly the fact that, you know, I and we are reviewing it from a sustainability perspective. Uh, you know, basically the Friends of Pheasant Branch perspective resonate perfectly with where I think I would stand with regard to the sustainability comment or position, which is this is totally inconsistent with our vision for sustainability. And uh, one, rezoning it from conservancy to institutional removes conservancy protections and priorities and reduces conservancy uh, area. And two, the addition of artificial turf with all the hazards implicit in that with the uh, microplastics as bottom line, I say no to the rezoning and I say no to uh, artificial turf to the extent that we and influence that decision. Thank you, Kermit. Laura? Uh, yeah, and just double checking, I don't see them here, but one thing I wanted to kind of hear from the artificial turf company, and they're not here, is that correct? I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I, I do see um, uh, Mr. Jamie Sims here, who is the athletic director. Um, so I'm not sure, Jamie, if you would, Mr. Sims, if you would like to say something, I can allow you to speak um, and talk during this portion. Um, so if you'd like to let me know um, in the comments or just let me know. Um, oh, and then I see Lindsay. So Lindsay, you have your hand up. Um, we can't see you. Do you do you have a comment, Lindsay? Are you with hey. the company? Yep. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm not with the Synthetic Turf Company. We are point of beginning. Um, we are the civil engineers that are helping the district out with the design process. 
Um, so we've been guiding them through synthetic versus natural. Um, I have myself, project manager. Um, I also have my project engineer with me here tonight, Jesse Becker. And then I also have um, Scott Kraholski, president of Point of Beginning on this call as well. Um, so we, we can try to field and answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, and Scott, Jesse, as well as Jamie, you guys can chime in with uh, whatever. We'll do. Jamie, if that's you, I think I hear you, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead, Jamie. Floor's yours. Um, no, I was just going to say we have Lizzie and her team here with us to answer any of those specifics that they can with regards to the artificial turf versus the natural turf. So I was just going to allow them to speak on in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Jesse, you well, I guess my, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess since they said answer questions, you know, um, one, we had our meeting last time and there were a lot of questions about like the runoff, the microplastics, all of that going in to the creek, which is the big environmental issue. Uh, I also looked up some of the cushioning, which I haven't heard anything about how there's um, potential health hazards um, if they're using tire crumb rubber underneath that not only could it be bad for runoff into the creek and things like that it can be bad for you know the, the students I haven't heard anything about that for their um, I guess health and safety so my question is in the cushioning do you use tire crumb rubber um, what can you tell me about the runoff um, and the, the plastics, and also what about proper disposal when it's done at its useful life, and was all that um, considered in the price estimate? Lindsay, do you want to, you got want to go, or do you want me to go? Um, I can tag team it with you, Scott. I mean, yeah. I can talk a little bit about this, Laura, and then Scott, you can chime in as well. Um, but I think I can, you know, dual conversation for PFAs and then microplastics. Um, in the last few years, synthetic turf and fill fibers have been tested and um, they do a similar test as they do to the water that you drink to test it for PFAs. Um, and they have came back negative to no concerns with harmful PFAs. Um, so the PFA issue has been debunked. Um, but when it comes to micro microplastics, you are correct. There is your typical synthetic turf surface. You're going to have your fibers, and then you're also going to have a sand and typically a crumb rubber infill. Um, and in that crumb rubber, there are microplastics. Um, but I believe as um, Robert Owen mentioned, there's different types of infill containment measures you can take. Um, such as fencing barriers around your field or constructing a berm, as he said. Um, you could also put uh, access gates from going on and off the field, as well as for your uh, fans. You can do those different gates to wash off and fill into a, into a gate. Um, then you could also put within your storm structures a micro filter to catch anything that might be running off. Um, that's if you wanted to collect any um, and fill that might um, run off. There's also, as mentioned, alternate organic sustainable infill options such as cork, wood, chip, natural plant mixes um, that I think could be great alternate solutions to avoid though that crumb rubber infill. Well, Lindsay, I'm gonna jump in, this is Christy, uh, with a quick question. You said that uh the these the uh you know turf has been have been tested for pfas is that what you said and it has yep. been okay who did Correct. that testing so specifically um we've been working and the district's been working with it's a turf vendor called field turf um and they have had their their turf fields along with their infill tested for these pfas um, and they're willing to and able to actually provide a letter stating with the different tests, 30 different tests that they take, um, that their, their turf, their infill, their turf system is free of these harmful PFAs. Okay. So yep. what you're telling me is that what you're telling us is that the turf vendor 
who's selling the turf did the testing. Is that right? Uh, yes, correct. Test? Okay. Yep. Yep. And, I, and Lindsay, as my understanding is that the PFAS or that family of chemicals, and, and we're not chemists or, or professionals mm -hmm. when it comes to writing these papers, but the, the research that we've done is that all of the turf vendors, you know, field turf and AstroTurf, Sprint, all of, you know, in, in recent years have removed PFAS from any of their, their, their products. So that's, from my understanding, the PFAS is not a um not one of the concerns and i think the and Lindsay, i think when you talk about the crumb rubber um i think the crumb rubber uh as, as well has been there's been studies done about the leaching and uh the, the, the rubber that's in, in your fields are the same that are on the tires that are wearing off on the road so i i believe that the amount of uh contaminants that are in that is very minimal I think you did hit on the one that when you said the microfibers, and I think, the, uh, Lindsay, I believe that's what you said, the or the microplastics. That's that I think is coming from break, the the fibers of the the turf itself slowly breaking down, and that is what uh, what really probably needs to be contained with some of those design uh, standards that were that the other gentleman listed, and he was actually almost it sounded like he was reading off the list that the synthetic turf council has put out there uh on how to contain some of those uh, of contaminants course. within the field laura you had your hand up earlier do you have more to you know comment on question uh, no i mean they've answered a lot of it I, I, it seems like now we're kind of zeroing in on the microplastics i mean we're all eating plastic. We're breathing plastic today. So it's something like every we're eating a credit card a month or something. We don't really know what that's doing to our bodies, but um, uh, that seems to be the biggest. How do you contain that? How do you control that? How do you keep that out of the, you know, washway? I, I don't know if that's. I mean, all the things that they talked about. Um, it, are those containment issues included in the cost that we're talking about? Because it does get down to like a fiscal responsibility here. If it costs so much to contain all this stuff and then to dispose of it at the end, we can't forget that disposal because again, Kermit showed us two or three links last week about how it's just creating a, a bit of a hazard after the fact. So. We don't, you know, if we're containing the hazard now, that's great, but that's not great if um, it's just pushing it down the road 10 yeah. years. Yeah, and, and Lindsay, and again, I we're not here to be pro-turf, right, or pro-grass. We want to, natural grass, we want to just tell you the facts and, and, and what we do, and we do this for a living. We install fields all over the state. Um, I, I do feel that, uh, these these synthetic turf companies are getting better with the recycling of their products. I, I know Field Turf does that, and and they're they're all grabbing onto this. To, so in in year twelve or thirteen, when this field gets recycled, uh, that it will be you know uh, recycled either into turf again or or other or other type of products. Um, and I do feel that uh, and, and as far as the cost, the question on the cost we would design all of those items into our design where you would uh, slope the fields, you know, so, so the water drains into the fields, not out. You know, I think Lindsay talked about the, uh, the, um, the, the filters that are put in the manholes or in the, in the, in the pipes to catch, catch as much of this uh, material as possible. So that is all, yes, that is in, even though we will be, you know, if, if this, if it would be approved, the project would be bid out and we would be putting those uh, mechanisms into the design. Okay, so so just for semantics here, so you, um, just to help answer Laura's question, you said they those costs of filtering and disposal would be factored in. And so have they been fact, just to make sure Laura gets a question, have they been factored into this cost estimate? Um, um, I can take that, Scott. Um, yeah, yes, ahead. we did. We did provi provide those costs to um, the school district to go to such a, you know, like Scott mentioned, an alternate infill versus 
um, the typical rubber and then also just factoring in, you know, maybe sloping the field away or putting in a fence barrier. Yes, we did account for those costs with the school district. Okay, thank you. Dick. Okay, um, I didn't think I was gonna speak on this. I'm a water scientist my whole career. I don't totally understand all of the pollutant issues related to this, but I have had numerous encounters with various projects where you have to maintain certain uh, treatment systems or structures or filtration beds to maintain the water quality that we are trying to achieve. And given that the Pheasant Branch Conservancy has already voted, they don't want to have less land, they don't want to convert conservancy lands to institutional to allow this. I don't like that uh, issue. And I think the maintenance issues, if you don't do it, and the school district would have to be doing it. And I just really feel like, okay, well, if you don't do it, like that we're saying in an ideal world, we will, then it becomes a risk. And I just feel like, why do it? And I think it was raised uh, a number of meetings ago uh, that potentially we could get some uh, federal money uh, to do things more sustainably. And as Kermit said, we are a sustainability committee. And I really feel that I don't see how I could personally recommend that we do this rezone just so we could facilitate the, the use of an artificial field when I haven't heard anything that shows the benefits of doing it. We're trying to say, well, we can mitigate that by doing various treatment practices, whatever. But I think that mitigation of a known pollutant or a problem puts the onus on the school district to maintain that. And these kinds of runoff systems with filtration beds, they are a nightmare to maintain. I, I would submit that. So I, I feel like that I, I don't know when you're ready to, uh, you know, move forward any kind of a approval or not motion, but I feel personally that I cannot vote for this. Thank you, Dick. Jesse. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, um, Jesse Becker, professional engineer with Point of Beginning. I'm the civil engineer, uh, stormwater and permitting uh, designer for the project. I guess um, to speak to Dick's points, I, I just wanted to, I guess, first off, I wanted to step back just a little bit in the conversation um, and kind of step back to the rezone uh, discussion. So I, I just wanted to point out the rezone is not necessarily equivalent to saying yes to synthetic turf versus natural grass. Um, with the new zoning code that was just implemented in the city of Middleton, uh, the Conservancy Zoning District does not allow for uh, a permitted use as conditional or just by right for active outdoor recreation. And baseball and softball fields are considered active outdoor recreation underneath the city zoning code. So what that means is... Um, you know, whether we, whether the school district does natural grass or they do synthetic turf, either or, um, unless this rezone is approved, they cannot do either because it's not a permitted use underneath the zoning code. So for that reason, um, you know, basically, if the school district is to move forward with a new softball field, new baseball field, they need an institutional zoning uh, rezone in order for that to happen, kind of irregardless of what surfacing is ultimately implemented for the field. Um, so just wanted to point that out, um, make sure that's clear that, you know, rezoning does need to happen even for natural fields. So thank you for that comment, uh, Jesse. I'm going to actually ask Kelly and Deb. Um, that was not my understanding, and I could very well be wrong, um, but I wouldn't mind some input on um, the rezoning aspect. I'm not You're muted, of course. 
Um, I'm not sure. I don't think I can answer that um, with certainty, the ins and outs of what conservancy zoning means as opposed to the institutional zoning means. Um, I think that the committee, if it's not comfortable making a recommendation or, you know, recommending denial could also could always um, weigh in with feedback about the actual turf decision. Um, that would be helpful information for planning commission to have as well. Um, I think that yeah, might have some, thank you, Kelly. Keep going if you wanna keep going. No, go ahead. Okay, Deb might have some feedback on that um, when she comes back. She, just for the group here, Deb has a weird computer, let's say, and she gets muted. <laughs> the only way she can get unmuted is for her to jump off and come back on. It's most frustrating for her. Um, <laughs> Deb, you're back. Um, let's have you comment, then um, Tony, and then Kermit. So um, Deb, we were just still, Kelly was just mentioning she's not, you know, she, she doesn't want to misstate and doesn't know exactly. So do you know if that's accurate, you know, or is that your understanding of it too? No, I didn't know that. And when we talked at the last meeting, the friends meeting uh, prior to this one, uh, nobody mentioned that, um, that why this rezoning needed to happen. Uh, I guess everyone was assuming it was AstroTurf versus, or artificial turf versus natural grass was the reason. So no, I didn't know that. Okay, Tony, thank you. So I, I wanted to comment on uh, two things that are related to the environment. The, the engineers may have uh, something to say in response to this, but I'd like the committee to consider it also. Um, the, the two things are heat and injury. So there's a, there's a good deal of evidence and even some medical societies oppose AstroTurf because of increased injury to uh, players, um, you know, because of the, uh, uh, the, the hardness of it, um, not as uh, good grip as grass. Um, and then the other thing is heat. Uh, that's been documented also that these playing fields are just hotter. Um, just as an anecdote, I spoke to two uh, acquaintances of mine who have kids. Actually, they're in the Oregon school uh, district uh, where, where they do not use turf. They, they use um, natural uh, grass. These kids say that when they travel and they play at a facility, um, you know, for an away game, that's on turf, they hate it. Uh, and they hate it because they don't look, you know, they don't like the feel of it, but most of all, because it's about 10 degrees hotter. <laughs> um, and it's kind of a, it, it's a strain. I can, I really don't understand why the school district would create an environment for kids to play athletics that is potentially harmful um, when there are the, the safe alternative that we've used, you know, for the last 150 years for baseball and soccer and so on. Um, but I, I don't know if there's anything, again, I'm not terribly interested in mitigating these things. I think it just, you know, I'm totally in favor of um, the, the, of the fields being developed, but they should be developed as, as, as grassy fields. Um, but maybe the engineers have some idea about how you know, they're going to handle the increased heat, which I, I can't imagine how they're going to handle that, uh, and and whether they're aware of the increased injuries and the um, warnings now that are, you know, th this is like not a brand new thing from my reading. This is a, a worldwide concern in developed countries that might consider using turf. Thank you, Tony. I'm also personally concerned about the heat um, and the heat, the studies that have documented the heat, as Tony mentioned, well documented. They are, you know, peer reviewed scientific studies from a variety of funded sources. So it's not, 
um, just one one thing. Um, so that is a concern for me as well. Yeah. And you mentioned the different plane. I know, um, like I, I don't know that much about soccer, but my son plays soccer, and when they play on turf, they need special shorts, special different clothes for slide tackles. I guess I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but yes, that was news to me. Um, you know, so do you? Do the engineers want to comment, or Tony? Do you want to? Do you have anything more? Um, well, I, 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 I think the microplastic runoff is significant, not, not because one or two fields are going to change, you know, the whole equation about having too much plastics. Um, but, uh, you know, there's very good peer reviewed scientific studies showing that about 15% of microplastics in bodies of water, rivers and lakes and oceans are from micro, microplastic runoff from turf. I have read that too, yes. Um, uh, and, I, and I also, you know, share the concerns that uh, have been expressed about managing toxic uh, chemicals. Um, you know, it, it, it's quite a headache, but I, I also think it's Probably, I mean, my own opinion. Again, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but my my hunch is it will have a marginal effect. Okay, thank you. Let's do this. Let's have give the engineers a chance to um, comment, and then we'll go to you, Kermit. Yeah. So I can maybe just quick speak to a couple of these items. You know, the heat. Um, when you use a sand and crumb rubber infill, it is warmer. You know, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, and, and but I think that's a, a pro and a con there too because think about what the school really wants to use this for is for softball and baseball and that season is started or it's starting when it's cold really cold and sometimes they're playing when there's snow so that so in the spring time of the year probably up until what maybe maybe June that that extra warmth is a value now when you get into the heart of the summer right and it's 95 degrees it, it is that the, the turf is warm, you know, um, so you, you probably just need to be smart with how you practice there. So I think that's, a you know, there's probably two sides of that, you know, of that debate. Um, you know, the whole injury thing, you know, this has been coming up more and more. Right. And, and we've been we've been designing and putting in fields for 20 years. And it just seems as of late, the, the lower leg injury uh, conversation has came up. Um, and I don't, I'm, I'm trying to get my hands around that. And we've done a lot of interviews ourselves with other turf vendors. Um, we are hired uh, every year. We probably, uh, between Lindsay and I and my staff, I bet you we walk, I bet you a hundred different athletic fields in that from baseball, softball, soccer, lacrosse, uh, both turf and grass every year. Okay. And I can tell you this factually that you can take a, a grass field that is 10 years old and compare it to a turf field that's 10 years old. And there are more risk of injury on that grass field for the majority of the K-12 schools that are out there because the field starts to settle, it gets tore up. And frankly, there, the budget isn't there to regrade and fix the field, okay? so. So in the perfect world, I would agree with you, I agree with you guys that if you had a unlimited budget, turf versus grass, natural, you're picking natural, right? I think what all turf is trying to do is emulate natural. Um, but in the reality of the K-12 school market and budgets are tight, uh, that safety factor, in my opinion, starts to turn. I've walked on fields that are grass, that are hard and potholes, which are injury prone. Okay. And uh, again, I'm not pro for the turf or against it, but I, you know, there's for every story, there's another debate to that side. Right. So I just want to make sure you hear that. Um, and I think uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was, and again, I, I don't want to be here trying to pitch this thing, but there's a lot of you know, for the school in that location, the amount of use that you can get out of that space with the turf is just so much greater than the grass. 
uh, just because grass can only take so much, you know, so much abuse and it's on, and then it turns into mud. Now, the one thing I would, recommend to the school is if the turf doesn't work out right we would hopefully be able to build them a really nice natural grass field but with that natural grass field and infield you are going to build a similar system with under drain and amended soil and you're going to really try to do some things with that so it's playable so it's dry when it's wet and then you water it to get it to grow so there's also negatives on that side of the ledger too, right? You're pumping, you're irrigating, you're pumping groundwater, you're using a lot of water to get your field. And there's a lot of negative, if you want to research that side of it. Um, and then there's all the, the, you know, the natural, you know, just the chemicals and fertilizers you use to keep a grass field playable. You know, so again, I, I totally, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with everybody on, on your, in your committee and on your group, but there are, uh, other sides to those to those debates, and um, I think the for the school and all the meetings that we had with them, the amount of use and how tight their site is there, they're just really restricted with 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 space. It's not, and there's some schools that are lucky and they got a lot of room. Uh, Middleton is not one of them. So, okay, thank you, Scott Kermit. Um, yeah. I guess part of my uh, focus here or invitation to focus to kind of, okay, what are the sustainability and environmental issues that are attached to the options that are being put before us? And um, to that end, you know, anecdotes about more or less injuries or more fields being hard packed and more, more prone to injury than than artificial turf uh, just doesn't seem to get to the bottom line issues that we as a sustainability committee, I think are trying to represent here. And in terms of sustainability, it seems like pumping more plastic into the environment and increasing the risk that it's going to be drained into our watersheds or flushed into our watersheds is not congruent with our sustainability goals and vision. So at the same time, I want to be on the you know, science and evidence based decision-making side of things. And that's where I'm uh, finding myself intrigued by the uh, Conservancy Committee and its proposal that included asking for an environmental impact statement, basically say, okay, well, what are the trade-offs? What would be the differential impact between, you know, normal, grass and artificial turf. Uh, and I would be personally curious and open to getting that kind of impartial, uh, nonpartisan assessment that could give us a sense of, okay, well, so we have microplastics because of artificial turf, but we have fertilizers and excess grant groundwater drainage because of the natural grass. And you know, so what what are the trade-offs? I mean, I again I don't claim to be an expert there, but I am at its face, it seems like artificial turf is a bad move and removing land from conservancy protection is a bad move. At the same time, if those protections can be maintained and if we can validate or document that there are not those negative impacts. Uh, I, I'm, I'm open to being proven wrong. Okay, but thank you, Carmen. Good feedback. Um, so I'm gonna have a quick comment and then I'll go to Dick. Um, <clears throat> in regards to uh, the um, natural turf and the maintenance and the fertilizer and how that's maintained, that really is 
um, <clears throat> a lot is very dependent on what the plan is for that area. So is it um, planned to use heavy chemicals and have the roots really shallow? Um, or is it planned, and, and this is something I had discussed with Mrs. Mr. Sims um, a, a while back um, via phone, is that um, you know there are ways to take care of uh, natural grass turf that are some ways are better than others. And so if it is natural grass turf, there are ways to do it um, better um, that require less water, less maintenance, um, you know, uh, um, catches more storm water runoff, those types of things. So just want to put that in there. Dick, you're up. Okay. Um, yeah, I like what you just said, Christy. I mean, there are ways of, I mean, obviously there's going to be maintenance on both ends. The maintenance on the turf field, you got to collect all the runoff and maintain the, the engineered collection facilities and filters and things like that. On the natural turf, you've got to keep it in, in good shape. But there on the front end, if you till the soil so it's not compacted, you can get better um, lawns established uh, and aerating and deep, you know, things like that. I guess the concern that I have after hearing all this other discussion is that in 10 to 14 years, the field has to be replaced. And we have all this material that has to be completely dug up, taken somewhere and disposed, disposed of or recycled somehow sustainably and a whole new field put down. And I just think the fact that the lifespan of an artificial turf is, I think Scott said 10 to 14 years, if I got heard the quote right, I just feel like, yes, we wanna be sustainable. This is next to the creek, it's in the conservancy. Um, I can see the Conservancy not wanting to rezone. <laughs> I don't know whether there's any way of saying we recommend for Title IX reasons, uh, they increase the athletic opportunities at the school location of putting playing fields in with natural um, turf so that uh, that moves ahead. And if it's possible to do it without rezoning, that's the better way. But if it has to be rezoned, then we should put in a recommendation that it would only be rezoned if the school district agrees that they will not pursue artificial turf options. Because I just don't feel like the, I haven't heard enough to suggest to me that the grass turf has less benefits than the, or the, than the artificial. And I just feel like uh, 10 to 14 years from now, you've got to rip the whole thing up, truck it somewhere, dispose of it somewhere, Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I don't want it. My my ancestors don't, or my relatives back there don't want it. Uh, so I, I, I want to see the playing fields put in, but I don't want to see artificial turf. So somebody could make a motion that would reflect that. I would be happy to vote for it. Okay, good point. Let's Hold your thought, please, but let's go to Laura. Yeah, I'm basically following up with Dick and Kermit because I was having some of the same concerns like with Kermit, like, all right, if this is, I want to follow science too, but all these plastics, I won't repeat everything. And then it comes around to, we are the sustainability committee. And I haven't heard any talk about climate change. And I have to think that natural turf even though it doesn't have the deepest roots, has got to be better than artificial turf that's sequestering something, you know, carbon. It's it's there. Even if you let the thing go to clover, you'd do a better job on on the climate change part. Um, and then the the equity part, like you know, I want the girls to have a soccer or a, a softball field. I like playing softball. I like I'm pro sport. My, one of my questions was. I'm, I'm with the conservancy. Why should they give up their land? I mean, you know, it's hard fought. So could they, instead of rezoning, could there be an exemption where, you know, it's kind of like conservancy take is control and that these fields exist as long as the school um, operates them in a way that is 
environmentally responsible and sustainable. Once you give that up and rezone it to institution, you pretty much lose all control there. The, the conservancy doesn't have a whole lot of say. We have some say, you know, maybe this first board, uh, school board agrees to it and then the board turns over and they change their mind and, and there you go and now things happen. So um, I didn't know that you could rezone or I didn't realize you had to rezone even for natural, I, you know, I would look into rezoning options. Like I, my tendency is to vote against rezoning, but to see if there would be an exemption, if it was natural, you know, more sustainably maintained turf so that the girls could have a site nearby as well. Isn't that a conditional use permit or something like that? Yeah, conditional use. And, and you know, I'm not sure about all that, but, you know, conditional use would allow that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're coming up on 730, you know, so just to be mindful of time, Jesse, I see your hand up. Um, if you, why don't you go ahead, but if you wouldn't mind just trying to keep it brief. Yeah, absolutely. I will keep it brief. Um, to Laura's point, um, as far as the rezone is concerned, uh, if the rezone is not approved, the only option the district would have to move forward with a new softball field would be to get a variance from zoning code. Um, condition Conditional uses are spelt out in the zoning code and active outdoor recreation is not a conditional use. So a conditional use permit um, could not be gotten, but a variance technically could be. That would be one option as an alternative to the rezone. Um, and I guess I would also state that approval of the rezone does not mean approval of the synthetic turf. There will be a site plan approval process where that would continue to be discussed. Um, and that may even be the more appropriate uh, just speaking from my point of view, a uh, place to discuss the land use specifically, because that specifically, that approval process is specific to what's being built, whereas the rezone is more big picture, like what kinds of things can be done here. Okay, um, thank you, Jesse. Yeah. No, Deb. Oh, you're, Deb, you're going to hate this. You should just keep yourself unmuted. Just keep yourself unmuted okay so deb's gonna come right back um so um what i what i heard uh I, I believe i heard is that the variance uh format would be a means to an end um to get the girls the field um to have the title nine equity that's what i heard if i'm understanding this right and i think um you know it sounds like the entire we all need verification on these things, but we could go along the route that uh, people have mentioned. Uh, but we'll wait for Deb to come right back. And again, let's have her keep her microphone yeah. on the whole time. She doesn't need to mute. And Lindsay, as you're as maybe while we're waiting for Deb to come back, was um, when you guys were talking about turf. I know there was different options for baseball and softball. Was that the infields you were looking at, or was that the entire fields, or what? Where where was that settled on? Um, we were looking at applying synthetic turf to the entire field. Um, so it'd be the infield and the outfield of the proposed softball and the existing baseball. You know, that would be another thing that I, you know, you'd maybe want to ask, respectfully ask is, you know, if, if the district considered only doing the infields on both baseball and softball, which which those are the problem, the really the problematic areas when it comes to the spring, you'd be cutting your footprint of the turf, to, you know, down by 70%. Um, is that something, <clears throat> and I and I feel, I, I feel your guys' pain here, your sustainability committee, but um, well, uh, I'm just trying to figure out a way to get the most use out of that. Yeah those spaces Wait, that's a good point scott i'm glad you brought that up one thing that if, if anyone goes back to watch the previous um and 
Deb is not back yet, is she? If anyone goes back to watch the previous uh, meeting that we had, it was very a very big point that um, the sustain our committee was not you know our way or the highway. It was we want some compromise here. We want we don't just want it all turf because you know for certain reasons we we were very open to um you know ideas like what you just suggested so um i guess kelly if you could make sure that's in the minutes um that would be great um and deb should be back shortly you know while we go wait, ahead laura you know, while we wait for like what Jesse was saying was, you know, we're talking about artificial versus natural grass, but really it's the, you know, the rezoning, but it seems to me then that if we approve the rezoning, you, you kind of, I mean, it's kind of institutional. That's what it is now. And that's a huge, you know, it's, there's nothing conservation about that necessarily. It seems to me that a variance is a bit of a compromise. And I do kind of like the idea that if you can reduce the artificial turf by 70% by making it infield only, again, if you can also stop all that runoff and stuff, I you know, it, it you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm still concerned about disposing of it, you know, but I get that there are budgets and I get that kids want to play ball. Um, and I think one of the reasons the school wanted all of the whole thing turf is the, again, is usability. So the outfields then could be used for everything from band to, to FIED to, you can really beat, beat it up, right? So that's, I know that's, they, they were all about the use and trying to maximize that space. And I yeah. don't want to speak out of line here either, because I don't know the school might not want to consider just the infields, but I, I'm just trying to, what I don't want to do is shut the, totally shut the door on turf in general. Cause we, we put this on schools all over the state and region and, and we have not heard any, we've not put in a field that there has ever been a, a, a comeback. Like, boy, we wish we didn't do that. And we put in a lot of fields in the last 50, 10 years and I can, I, and I honestly can say there's never been a regret that I have heard of. It, it's been Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Um, yeah. Deb, go ahead. Okay, I think it's unmuted, yes? Just keep it unmuted, yes, Deb. Right. We'd like to hear you <laughs> anyway. Unmuted, and it went back to <laughs> muted or something. Anyway, my question is, um, current use is their practice fields. So they're doing you know, these games, softball, et cetera. Why is that different than a real game versus a practice game? Why, why would they have, um, could use conservancy lands for practicing, but they can't use it for a game? I, I don't understand the difference. Um, Jesse. 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 Yep, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so, I guess I don't have the previous zoning ordinance in front of me, so it's quite possible that something has changed from the previous version of the ordinance to the current ordinance that affects that directly. Um, I guess speaking to the current zoning code, which is what you know what we're working with moving forward, um, passive outdoor recreation is an approved, permitted by right principal use for conservancy zoning. Um, I don't have the definition of passive outdoor recreation in front of me, but my understanding just generally would be that would be, you know, walking or, you know, maybe, you know, just going out and running and that sort of thing. So it'd be very uh, minimal buildup of any sort. So the facilities associated with a baseball or softball field, you know, you've got to have dugouts. Um, you want to have walking paths to said dugouts, that sort of thing. I but believe that's what field. takes it from passive to active. Um, Deb, Deb has a comment, Jesse. Jamie Sims, aren't these practice fields for the very games that that would be, you know, with with two teams? Aren't these aren't they playing the same games? They're not passive active, are they? I mean, passive use. Mr. Sims, would you mind Mr. coming? What's the question again? 
The question is, what are these practice fields used for now? Is it passive or is it active sports? Both. So currently these practice fields are used for, so in the fall they're used for um, practices. And then in the spring right now, they're used for practices. Last spring, we did use them for some contests, um, some active contests for the North practice field right now, which would become the softball complex. But um, they're used for, for training and practice purposes and have been used for contest as well. Okay, so I, I don't see why all of a sudden if you change the zoning, it's going to change the use. Because they're already being used for games, they're already being used for active uh, practice. Sounds yeah, like think... it's a very good question. Jesse, you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, I guess just speaking uh, generally, uh, right now the area that the softball field would be built in, it's kind of just open green space. Um, it may have soccer striping, but otherwise it's just kind of a big open green field. So as part of this project, they would be developed into a softball field. So I, I think that's the main difference, at least from my point of view. Okay. Okay. So we, I think we have, Deb, do you have more on this? Go ahead if you do. Okay. I think we've discussed this extensively. Um, so at this point, if someone in the committee would like to make a motion about how you'd like this to go forward. Unless we have further discussion from the committee. Um, I, I'll be looking for a motion for what the committee would like to do. Dick? Well, I think we got in front of us this particular rezoning and I think the motion would be that we uh, do not recommend rezoning from conservancy to institutional, but recognizing the need to improve the athletic facilities uh, for Title IX, whatever, uh, we recommend that other options, including a variance, be pursued as long as the school district uh, is willing to um, go uh, mostly um, natural grass surfaces. I actually, this is not part of my motion, but I'd actually uh, thought also about the infield yeah. being partly uh, artificial, uh, but I, we don't have that as a proposal in front of us. And Scott didn't need and indicated maybe the school district doesn't even want that. Yeah. So my totally. motion would be to deny the, um, the to, to not recommend, not deny, but to not recommend that the, cons the, the, uh, zoning change be from conservancy to institutional be um, uh, allowed, but that recognizing that uh, variances might be pursued as long as it would allow uh, artificial, uh, I'm not sorry, uh, well, all, all natural uh, grass um, playing fields be developed. Tony, did, thank you. Tony, did you have a comment? Oh, no, I was just getting ready to second that motion. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So we have a motion. Um, do we need Kelly to repeat the motion? And, and we I have think, a second. I think I need I need Dick to repeat it. I have Lathrop motions. We do not recommend rezoning from conservancy to institutional, but recognize that there should be improvements through a variance pursued if natural playing fields can be developed by the school district. But that's really- That's, that's pretty close to what I had. I think you just added in the equity part. Like we want we want to recognize that we get that it's a girl's soft, you know, we want equity. We want girls to have a playing field too. The Title IX equity with the addition of the girls softball field. Yes. Yeah, that we are looking for uh, solutions that would provide uh, uh, Title IX equity for um, um, what, I don't know if it's girls sports, women's sports. Uh, do we need that kind of language or just leave it Title IX equity or how, how do we need to? I don't know that you even need it in yeah. there. I mean, yeah. your motion is about the zoning, right? Right. 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 Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I kind of like what Kelly had, but I recognize what Laura was saying. So if, if we need to indicate that the reasons we want uh, the option to, that the school district can pursue with a variance, uh, you know, I said title name, before, I mean, uh, um, conditional use permit. I was wrong. I was thinking of a variance. That's what I, so when somebody brought that up, that, that was exactly what I was thinking as a solution. Okay. Okay. Do you have that down, Kelly? Somewhat. Just, um, just a minute. Okay. And is there any is there any way? And I and I, I, was, I was trying to track the motion. Is there any way that you could, if the school did want to pursue a, a smaller footprint of turf or a reduced footprint, that you could kick that to the next group to approve, or are you just saying flat out no to anything artificial? Well, I think the variance is basically saying we're not going to allow, we're not recommending, we don't have any ability to stop it, but we're yeah. not recommending that the zoning change be made, but we're recognizing that the need for playing fields to meet Title IX uh, equity considerations, uh, that, that the variance be considered to meet Title IX considerations, and that options need to be included in the variants that are basically acceptable. And I'm not saying that, you know, but basically cutting way back on your use of artificial turf, if you were willing to go for the infield, uh, I think that's a reasonable compromise to consider, but that's not what's on the table here. Yeah. Okay, Kelly, do you have it down? <laughs> oh gosh. This is not my strong point. We'll try, okay. we'll try it we again. can always go back. I, I can read it what I have. And yeah. then um we I do want to wordsmith this, even if it's painful, because I want to get this motion right. <laughs> um Lathrop motions, we do not recommend a rezone from conservancy to institutional, but recognize the need for playing fields that meet Title IX considerations and that options need to be included within a variance that would allow. I'm trying to get the natural playing fields contingent upon them being natural playing fields. Yeah. Anyone have um, the last part of that? Um, Laura, I mean, jump uh, in. Yeah, or Dick, Laura. Well, well let me just finish. Uh, yeah. I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is that the variance would have to be considered later by the Planning Commission and others. And if it's deemed that a recommendation comes back from the design team and the school district, well, we'll put in natural grass, but the the infield areas, which is relatively small, we would like to see, uh, rec we would like to have artificial turf, but that would be part of this variance that they're requesting, right? We're not recommending that that be done. We're just saying that a variance would allow for natural grass, but- I mean, if, yeah. Or maybe you could say something along the lines that, you know, um, Nash, Scott, Scott, if you don't mind, when you have a comment, would you mind just throwing your hand up? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank sorry. You. Okay. Maybe you could do two motions and then you can separate out these ideas somewhat. I think that would also be possible. Right. But, okay. but I think the motion, as Dick said, it was the clear part and important part was that um, whether it's a variance or maybe ultimately approval. I mean, we're not recommending approval, but um, th that it be conditioned only on uh, using natural grass. We're not deliberating, you know, how much turf or, you know, other questions. I mean, we just we just need to state the sustainability question um, that's been framed here. So I think I think we're basically saying, you know, we we would want to make whatever is done contingent on uh, using natural grass. I, you know, rather than open up another discussion about partial <laughs> astroturf and so on. I mean, that's not our business. Okay, thank you. Good point, um, Kermit. Do you have a follow up to that? And we want to kind of try and. Keep this moving along, which I know you know. Um, yes. Um, I guess I, it would help to 
clarify, make sure that our understanding of variance uh, so that what we're suggesting makes sense. In other words, you know, part of how I understand variance when it comes to zoning is it provides a process by which a landowner can provide a different, can use a area of their property in a way different from what it is typically zoned for. And that there's a process then where they need to jump through hoops and talk to different people and come up with a plan that then everybody agrees to. And it's it's like we're kind of, but if we say, okay, we're gonna change the zoning and now it moves to a class of zoning that lets them do whatever they want, then we lose that process and the chance for the public to have input and for things to be nailed down or, 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 or optimized in the course of a deliberative process. So I don't think, so I'm agreeing with the basic thrust of the, the motion, uh, but I'm not sure it's clear enough yet for what we're trying to do. Yeah, let me just, let me just say, my motion was to deny or not then I do not recommend that the that the the um, rezoning be approved, but recommend that a variance could be considered because of Title IX considerations. I think Kelly, you had that pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, for and considerations of a playing field, and like you're saying, Kermit, they would have to go back and request if they need to request a a you know the 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 approval to put in a natural turf field. And I, I agree, um, you know, with, with, with the comment before that uh, um, we're, we're not recommending that they negotiate, well, what percentage of the field. We're just saying natural grass. But we're saying we, that a variance could be pursued. And I don't, I'm not in favor of having delay on a study that we need an environmental impact statement on this. I think it's too small a thing. Uh, and it would take it would delay the whole thing, and I'm sure the school district doesn't want that. Carmen, do you have another quick comment? Um, I'm just so it sounds like. I mean, they can pursue a variance. We don't need to recommend that they do that. You know, if we say we, so maybe I mean, if we can simplify the motion to, we do not recommend zoning category be changed from conservancy to institutional. Leave it at that. And leave it at that. Wow. Because they, they, for whatever reason they want to, they can pursue a variance. A variance is a natural, I mean, is a standard zoning process as I understand it. Okay, so where are we at? Well, I have, this potential motion, Lathrop motions, we do not recommend a rezone from conservancy to institutional, but recommend a variance be pursued due to Title IX considerations. Yeah. That a variance but, could be could but, pursued to 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 meet Title IX considerations by in uh, a playing field, the, the building of a playing field with natural grass. Yeah. I, I guess, Kermit, I understand what yeah. you're saying. We can make it clean. This is what it is. We're just saying, no, we're not recommending it. But I think what I'm trying to do is give some clarity to where we think it ought to go. And if we don't communicate that somehow, whether, yeah. it's, whether it's in the motion or not, then I feel like that we haven't given some direction to uh, any commission. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think, I think we need to say what our reason is because that the motion is well Kermit I think as I was hearing it was it it leaves some ambiguity are we saying this because of the grass versus turf issue or are we saying this because we you know we agree with the Conservancy Land Commission that you know we should just keep the Conservancy as Conservancy and preserve as much land as possible which was their their um rationale um but I, I think we need to say what dick was saying that, that 
that we don't want the artificial material. Hey, Laura. Yeah, I'm. I agree with that. I wanted to, you know, the the friends of peasant branch were very clear. We don't want to give up conservancy land. So basically, we should say we should be very clear too. We don't want to give up conservancy land, but we understand the need for Title IX. I, I like both yeah, parts, right. even if you do it in, two, in both parts. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it lets them know we didn't just say no, but we've been talking about this for three months and it's a, it's a reasonable compromise. And Deb made a good point. They're already practicing on it. Why do we, you know, I... Okay, Kelly, wanna reread? Well, I still have as the motion, Lathrop motions, we do not recommend a rezone from conservancy to institution, but recommend a variance could be pursued to meet Title IX considerations. And then the minutes could reflect the reasons why, unless you wanna make bullet points as part of the motion for the reasons, but I think the real motion is the action that you're taking. Right. Not so much like the whole conversation in the motion. Right. That's my understanding. Yeah, but we did say that variance could be considered for Title IX considerations if a, a natural uh, turf, gra natural grass surface could be or would be allowed. Or you know, I I, I guess if we don't just say, well, you can, you can go for a variance, but they could say, well, we want we want um, artificial turf. They're, so they're basically, we, we denied the rezoning, but we didn't say we don't want artificial turf. And I think we need to be clearer. And so that's what I had in my motion. I think we you stated it earlier that for Title IX considerations, a, a, vi a variance could be considered uh, if the school district is willing to uh, pursue it as natural grass. You want me to add, um, after Title IX considerations, add contingent upon development of natural turf? Natural grass. Natural grass. Yeah. Sand. Well, I mean, turf, but I don't want to, artificial turf and natural turf. I think it's nat artificial turf and natural grass keeps it clear distinction. I don't, I don't want to use turf both ways. Yeah. Tony, does that feel like what you were saying too? Yeah, exactly, uh, Dick, thank you. Okay, so one more time, Kelly. Lathrop motions, we do not recommend a rezone from conservancy to institutional, but recommend a variance could be considered, considered yeah. to meet Title IX considerations contingent upon development of natural grass. Playing fields playing fields. Okay, so that accomplishes what you're looking for with re recommend no rezoning from Conservancy, but also puts in the, um, just the additional oh. points for consideration, right? Yeah, that's my motion more or less. And okay. and, uh, and uh, if somebody wants to uh, have an objection to that and make an amendment, then we can vote on the amendment. And Kermit, you would have to say, do you want to keep yeah. it simpler? And I right. and we could vote on the simpler version. And, and then if that was denied, yeah. then we go back to the original motion. Do you have something? Oh, Laura, Laura do you have a comment, Laura or Kermit? I didn't see. Yeah. Um, I'm just con I'm concerned that the bottom line is we want na natural grass or natural turf. And whether or not the field is modified or built for Title IX or something else doesn't determine whether or not we're saying we don't want to approve, we don't want to recommend the zoning change. We will be open to supporting a variance that uses natural grass. Yeah, but the Title IX is the reasoning why we want to encourage this playing field yeah. option to be pursued. So that's why I think 
Laura right. and I well, both agree on that one. That I, I'm, I'm assuming, Laura, you're still there. I, I'm. This. I'm. I'm. It's just, but but, it's not a question of. I mean, they could whatever reason they want to put it, whatever they want a reason they want to put in a field. We're saying it should be natural. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. Okay, let's and go. So ahead. it's like the 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 the, the Title Nine, in the context of that motion, seems like it could be confused. It, confuses the matter and Let, let's, go to Deb. <laughs> let's go to Deb quick. Okay, we've got to remember, we're talking about two fields here. We're talking about a boys field for baseball. We're talking about a girls field for softball. And you're just talking about title nine for the girls. So I, I don't know that right. you want to limit your, yeah. your motion to just- Okay, I would, ex okay, I would, if Laura agrees, I would accept taking out the title nine reference. Yeah, you, you can know, take that out. You were saying both playing I mean, fields think, should be grass. Yeah. I mean, I think that, right. I think the problem was with Title IX when we saw it previously is that the boys' field was what, like, not like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars more than the girls. It's like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Um, well, the girls' field is out on the way to cross planes, and the boys' field is on property. Okay. I would accept the friendly um, <laughs> amendment to remove yeah. the Title IX reference. You can take okay. that out. Let me to read it back. Yes, please. Lathrop motions, we do not recommend a rezone from conservancy to institutional, but recommend a variance could be pursued contingent upon development of natural grass playing fields. Perfect. That covers and both. And, yep. and could I ask As just clean. I it correctly? Oh. The word field is fields, right? With its plural. No, I, heard, I heard her say fields. Fields. Okay, okay, thank you. Good. Plural. Fields. I heard her say fields. No, okay, you. so I believe we have a motion on the floor. Is that right? <laughs> Do we have a second for that motion? I second it. Okay. I second. <laughs> okay, so let's take a vote. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Wow. Okay, I would like to, now that we have the vote done, I would like to state something for the record here to the group um, because we have Mr. Sims on. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, this vote as a change to what was originally proposed is not a reflection of, you know, the good job that I think and I have observed Mr. Sims doing. He is newer to the district um, and I am, as a, I've stated to this committee, I'm also on the um, you know, fundraising committee for the athletic department. And I have been just very impressed with Mr. Sims and his job and the job he does and his team and everything. So, you know, this diversion from the original request has absolutely nothing to do with um, his great work um, that he is doing um, on behalf of the school district. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you very much. That means a lot. You are welcome. It's true. Thank you. Okay, great. This was good job, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Everyone on this call, everyone on this Zoom for your patience. I know it's hard when you have something to say and you want to, you don't want to wait. And, you know, we, we're trying to do the Roberts rule. So thank you, everyone, for your contributions to this and uh, your thoughts and your reading and everything. We really appreciate it. So, um, given that, that we have finality on this issue, um, let's uh, move on, I believe, yeah. to the next. Yeah, Christy, could I ask that we move up the sustainability awards for the in staff fact, report? Yep. We, fact, have Kelly, to, we have to get that done. Yes. Right. In fact, Kelly already smartly suggested that earlier. So that was the plan. And I'm glad you're on the same page. <laughs> so you're up. You and Deb are up. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, our committee of five, which is three committee members, uh, Christy is chair, Deb and I, uh, Kelly uh, is a sustainability coordinator for the city, and we have one at-large citizen, and that was uh, Rick Eilerston. Uh, we met, uh, we had 15 um, nominations that came in by the end of February. And our, our subgroup has 
uh, determined that eight of them have met the criterion criteria for receiving awards. And so, um, Kelly, can you bring up the, on your share screen, or I can do it, but you can maybe you can do it uh, if it, if you've got it there uh, on who won the awards, and we'll read off the names and the statements that we have crafted uh, for why they got the awards. And the process is, is that we would like, we're recommending to the full committee tonight that this, that these um, nominees receive the awards and that uh, you would vote on them as a committee to accept our recommendations so that then we can go forward and have certificates prepared and uh, the certain entities, which I'll talk about, will get certificates uh, affixed to wooden, reclaimed wooden plaques, plaques. and then uh, that will be three of them, and five of them will, uh, the, of the recipients, will receive a $100 um, gift card. So um, if any questions on that process, and I'll read the awards. Anybody have any particular questions about the process up to what I've just described. Okay, so you are seeing the screen share. Uh, these are the blurbs that we have crafted and the, uh, the entities, the, the businesses, the organizations and the individuals. Uh, I'm listing the, um, the, the individual, I mean the businesses and organizations first and then the individuals afterwards. So before um, organizations and businesses. So Keneal Corner Conservancy uh, is going to be getting an award and they would get um, a certificate and a $100 um, gift card to use uh, for their activities. And they're receiving the award for converting a small weed infested neglected lot into an attractive sustainable conservancy by adding a bur oak and native prairie plants beneficial to pollinators and for installing a reading bench and a little free library with educational materials for users of nearby nature trails. The Holy Wisdom Monastery uh, is getting an award, which will be a, a, a plaque with a certificate attached for installing a 300 kilowatt solar array with phase plans for battery storage to utilize excess energy and plans for converting the retreat and guest house HVAC system to geothermal. These changes together will allow the monastery with its extensive sustainable prairie landscape to produce 100% of its energy needs from renewable sources, making it Wisconsin's first net zero retreat center. Cromery Middle School, uh, as part of the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District, for implementing and installing sustainability practices in the rebuilt school, including geothermal heating, cooling, solar water heating, LED lighting, rooftop and parking lot runoff directed to rain gardens maintained by sixth grade students with guidance from Pheasant Branch Conservancy Naturalists and for environmental actions, including student-led efforts to increase recycling practices and reduce food waste with plans for composting. Pfizer, the Middleton site, for creating a net zero master plan to reduce water and energy usage while cutting greenhouse gas emissions 95% by 2040. Action plans include installing rooftop solar panels, an indoor chilled water handler, and energy efficiency metering. Early easy win actions, including fixing many building air leaks and replacing damaged HVAC rooftop coils that together save 71 megawatt hours of electricity. Overall, first year actions produced a 13% decrease in water use a 10% decrease in energy use, and a 7% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Can you scroll up a little more, Kelly, please? More up? 
Yeah, thanks. Right there. So now these are individuals. Herb Garn. For decades of exceptional environmental stewardship of Middleton's water resources through many sustainability actions that include being a founding member of Friends of Pheasant Branch Conservancy and co-chair of its Watershed Commission, building a strong citizen-based water monitoring program for the Pheasant Branch Creek system and educating students and the public about protecting and enhancing the community's water resources including the Conservancy Springs. James Struvey, for donating $50,000 to seed Pheasant Branch Conservancy's acquired farmland acreage. The seeding established platinum prairie habitat that supports endangered grassland birds and other wildlife, and that provides improved water quality and flood control, increased carbon sequestration, a more diverse seed source for other prairie plantings and enhanced recreational and educational opportunities for the community. Susan West, for two decades of sustainable habitat restoration work in Middleton, including organizing volunteers to conduct a major landscape restoration of Middleton Hills Oak Savannah Conservancy Area, mentoring and helping students maintain Native Prairie at Northside Elementary School and landscaping her own yard with native plants. And then finally, scroll up a little bit more. Maybe it's not all there. Kelly, scroll up a little more. I think it is that it might be. Okay, the okay. I'm not seeing at the bottom, but I, I got enough of it. Daphne Joyce Wu, there we are for her leadership in creating the Middleton High School Green Team, for working tirelessly on the passage of the school district's multifaceted resolution called Global Warming Through Clean Energy, Waste Reduction, Sustainable Choices, and Environmental Education, for creating the Dane County Youth Environmental Committee to accelerate change in the high school students' communities throughout Dane County, Wisconsin, and for serving three years as a member of Middleton Sustainability Committee and actively participating in many committee events. So the individuals that I just mentioned, the last the four would be receiving the certificate and a hundred dollar uh, gift card, as well as the Keneal uh, Conservancy uh, uh, Corner uh, Corner Conservancy because they would use the, the gift card more than they have no place to put a plaque. So Holy Wisdom Monastery, Cromery Middle School, and the Pfizer um, Middleton uh, unit would uh, be getting plaques. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, Kermit. Uh, I am delighted with all those names and organizations and the activities that have been described. I just have one or, or a question regarding just clarifying statements of fact uh, regarding Daphne. Uh, my memory is that there was a Middleton High School green team that predated her. Would you mind scrolling, uh, Kelly, to Daphne? Thank you. And so I, th I think she rejuvenated or revitalized, but I don't know if she created, and Deb, you might have oh, more history. New York yeah, you're right, you're right. It, we had an ecology club uh, for a long time, and she reorganized, she renewed and reorganized. Yeah, she did, you're right. Okay, so I mean, just, just so that everybody else that came before isn't just treated okay. as top level. Well, that's a good question, we will take We'll, and then, we'll make an adjustment to that. And a similar mm -hmm. adjustment related to the Dane County Youth Environmental Committee. Um, no, she did do that. that. There, there wasn't one prior to Daphne. I know there wasn't one prior, but I, my impression was that it was a, a multi-school effort. Um, you know, so I, again, I, I wasn't directly involved. I know Kathy Kuntz maybe is a more direct party if we wanted to check if people don't know for sure but she, nominate, she nominated her yeah i took the language that was in the nomination and okay well, distilled if, it down if, but, if kathy but, if kathy attributes creating it to her then i will defer i'll totally defer to that yeah. 
but in the case of the high school, I thought, and Deb seems to have confirmed that there was a green well, there, team before. Well, there, I didn't think there was a real green team, right? Is was it some called something else, Ecology Club or something, Deb? Well, it was yes, it was called Ecology Club. She changed the name and reorganized it, and yeah. I mean, we had an environmental organization prior. So I guess she created the green team because we didn't have a green team. We had a ecology okay. club, if you want to look at it that way. Are you okay with that, Kermit? I, 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 I can hear that clarification. And if that, I understand that. So if people are good with it, I, I will take, take the clarification and okay. stand up. Thank down. you. Okay. Again, this was language. I didn't. I didn't come up with this all on my own. This was language that Kathy Kuntz put in uh, her nomination. And of course, okay. Deb. I, I rely heavily on Deb. Deb helped a lot on this editing. Uh, uh, we wordsmithed yeah. everything yeah. down, and so the creation of the green team. Mm -hmm. Deb, if, if are you comfortable with that, or do we need to change that particularly? Yeah. Um she created the green team. She, you know, yes, there were other groups before that, but they were not called the green team. They were called something else. So okay. we can leave it. Okay. I, it. I would Thanks. just like to, thank you, Kermit. Good thoughts. I would just like to make a comment that, you know, you're seeing the end product here. Uh, and of course they make it look so easy as they have done in previous years, but there is a lot and I have seen it all that has gone into this. I mean, many, many hours, careful deliberation on their part just to make things as fair as possible and um, just really, you know, as accurate as possible. And you can see tonight they're open to, you know, corrections if needed, um, but a lot of just really thoughtful um, care and consideration went into this. Um, so um, just want to give a congrats. I, I want to... I want to say that uh, you, Christy, and and Rick, and Rick. Uh, b both both contributed heavily in uh, in Kelly. So the, the, even Kelly though, too, yes, yeah, yeah. So it was a a team effort to to of course come up with these uh, nominees and, and and giving them awards and recognizing them, and then taking a very complicated you know <laughs> nomination form. And then uh, summarizing it into something that could be put on the actual certificate, and we wordsmith, and everybody caught little errors and little changes. So this has gone through about seven or eight iterations. Um, so, 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 how do we go about giving the Sustainable Middleton Award Committee a Sustainable Middleton Award award? Yeah. And we if we are can't do that, held... I just want to say thanks. Everybody. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So I think what we're looking for here is this right? Is is a, a motion to approve these awards? Is that right? And to yeah. accept them or approve them. To accept yeah. the awards as submitted. Yep. Do we have a motion? I uh, I move we accept the list of sustainable Middleton Award winners as submitted and that's it. That's, That's it. it. We have a second. Mm -hmm. A second. Laura, wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. And then these awards will be given out on the 16th of April at the council meeting, 730. Mm. And and we need to announce them into the media and press and whatever. So Kelly, do you have any ideas about how to get this list um, distributed? Yeah, I will all hand this over to Brent, our communications director, to disseminate. Okay. Thank you. So is he writing the? He's writing the spiel. Well, if you would like, do you, would you like him to write this bill? He could, um, or if well, you would like to- one who he disseminates, in other words, gives our spiel to somebody else, or if he writes it and gives it to somebody else. I mean, yeah, if he can write it up, that's fine. But Last year, I know it got in the Middleton paper and they pretty much gave the names and repeated our statements. So I don't know how much additional stuff, do you remember Deb yeah. about what the award was about and why we're 
doing it? Uh, I think I just wrote a little paragraph of explaining what the award was and and then and then gave these short yeah. descriptions. Yeah, so maybe it would be worthwhile for you to communicate that same format and language to Kelly so she can pass it on so that there's some context about what the award's about. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we have this agenda item wrapped up. Okay. Right. Uh, do, oh, Kermit, go ahead. Jessica, uh, it's happening at City Council. How big of a deal do we want to make of it? Do we want to have a showing of committee members to be there or I have a conflict that night. I can't be there. <laughs> yeah, whoever wants to come certainly. Uh yeah. yeah the more the great. merrier, right? More the merrier, yeah. I okay. I suspect the high school green team um Cromery the Cromery green. green team um uh, are going to want to uh uh attend number of members so as, as soon as they know when the award's going to be given out. Um, I did I did check the language with them uh, um, the other day just to make sure that I got everything that they were doing right. And I got one minor little thing back that I incorporated this morning. So, uh, but I'm pretty sure the, the high school, the, the, the Karamari green team is going to want to sh show up. They have their own green team in Karamari Middle School. And they're quite quite active. So there'll be a lot of people there. So sure, we would love to have uh, uh, the committee show up and support it. But at the minimum, Deb and I will be there. Christy can't yeah. make it. And of course, Kelly will be there. Uh, Rick, uh, you're, of course, most welcome to show up too. So, so please email the reminder. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Okay, let's move on. We want to, I want to try and cut off right at 830 if we can. Um, so if people have uh, questions for Kelly about the staff report, um, let's have those now. Um, and then I would love to leave time for the utility flyer insert if possible. Um, so let's go. Anybody have questions on the staff report for tonight? Uh, Tony. Um, you're muted, Tony. Sorry. Um, I just had, I think, a quick question. The, the items that have to do, um, like uh, in the Navigator program uh, and other ones, um, let's see, uh, Lakeview Village Apartments, Solar, any of the items that, you know, where major uh, installations are done that would possibly uh, merit uh, rebates to the IRA. Well, what I wonder is, are, are, are any of those being applied for through the IRA, those kind of rebates? We um, met with a the city attorney today to talk about this because this has been an ongoing question for Madison and Middleton and Elevate Energy, who are our partners on but actually both projects, Lakeview and the Energy Efficiency Navigator Project, um, they're not the only partners on Lakeview, but they're one part of it. And um, with the Navigator Project, we have questions about how to capture that IRA 30% rebate on things like solar and heat pumps because the building owners do not live in the buildings. And they also, the, the building owners we're working with, um, file their taxes as individuals and not as a business entity. So we haven't found a workaround yet on how to take that 30% tax rebate. And it would also involve, um, it would also involve um, some as of yet undecided ways of subgranting money. Will we subgrant that to the building owner? And then with, with contracts that lay out the risk for the city and protect the city, and then the building owner would purchase the solar. Like we haven't found a way to do it yet and elevates a national organization and they're working, asking this question as well. Um, and I've talked to Baker Tilly about it. Um, I've questioned everyone I know 
and all the other municipalities and we are still looking for that answer. I I think moving forward, if we do anything even like the Energy Efficiency Navigator Project in the future, we'll need to figure out how to do it in a way that captures the IRA rebate because that's the only way it's gonna be scalable in multifamily affordable housing is if we can get that rebate. Um, the ARP, using ARPA funds has added another layer of question for reporting requirements and subrecipients and a lot of contractual yeah. legalese. So it's been, we've learned a lot, but it's been um, really challenging. Yeah, well, thank you and um, for the answer, but thank you for all that work. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly is working hard on that. Deb. Uh, for number one, I was just wondering um, if you would know the percent or the number of, per total streetlights that um, this money is going to be replacing with LEDs. Because I know mg and &E owns some of the lights and, and they're going to replace some of them. So how much of the lights are getting replaced with this oh. money? Right. Of the city owned streetlights, it'll be well over half of what the city owns. The remaining approximately 200, um, we're going to try to order between 500 and 600 lights with this money. But there's still going to be an additional about 200 to switch over, but they're the really expensive ones in Middleton Hills and the North Lake neighborhoods. So we're trying to find a cheaper workaround for those so that if we get another grant from WSDOT, Wisconsin Department of Transportation, we can take care of those remaining city-owned lights. Um, the MGE lights are still, there's still, there's still a question on how we get those transitioned in a timely manner if we don't own or operate those lights. Thank you. If no more questions, Christy, you're muted. This. Thank you. I just realized, Lynn, go ahead. Uh, this was on the solar discussion. Uh, there's apartments going up here in North Middleton, uh, Red Tail Ridge. And uh, the developer was asked about pre-wiring that roof for solar. When it comes down to paying for that, uh, their response was, uh, they need to have union laborers to qualify for some of the IRA money. And so the commitment to install solar was kind of kicked down the road to um, we'll see what happens, see if we qualify. Uh, so I'm curious as far as what kind of incentive the sustainability um, committee provides to developers to actually install solar. Um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Is that a question for me or for the committee? Uh, I guess for Kelly. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's some, there's a lot of provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, and then also grants that we have in the city from other entities on Buy American or prevailing wage and different things. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of all the IRA things for each type of rebate. There's a lot of different credits you can take. Um, I would say that right by Wisconsin statute, the city cannot require a developer to do anything unless it's in a TIF district or it's a rezone. So we have no real power. We can incentivize solar if the new development is in a TIF district, and then it could follow from our TIF policy and negotiations with the city to help incentivize solar that way. Um, I think one way to help incentivize would be to um, help with solar group buys and promote those as kind of a soft incentive, but make it easier for people. And Soul Smart, I think will streamline the permitting process and the hoops that residents would and businesses would need to go through to do solar, but those are all just kind of soft incentives. The Efficiency Navigator Project does um, provide funding just until the end of this year with ARPA funds for solar. But again, we're still working through contractual issues with that. So I'm not gonna promise that that's gonna happen, but that's our intent. Okay, thanks. Good eight incentives, Lynn. 
uh, that they can take advantage of too. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're limited um, based on, except for TIFF and the other. Um, okay, other questions? Otherwise, um, I actually want to give Lynn big time credit uh, and Deb for, and Kelly for the utility flyer. If people don't mind, we moved to that for the last several minutes. So Lynn being new to the committee, of course, showed off his amazing skills right away. Um, and um, we did this, uh, or mostly Lynn <laughs> and Deb, um, but this, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, this two-sided one pager, so two sides will go in the utility flyer. So everyone will see this. Um, we have, you know, Deb created a great lineup for the sustainable U. This was really all Deb um, for that. Um, and then, you know, lots of back and forth. Again, here's the final product. It looks like it was super simple, but again, so much went into getting to this point. Um, and Lynn was very patient with all these edits and changes. Um, and so here we are. Um, so Lynn, I actually have one question for you and that this is so good and so helpful. And we haven't had something like this in a while that um, you mentioned that this really nice picture you have of the, you know, the granary, you know, was for, you know, you were kind enough to, you know, allow the rights to use it for this utility flyer. I'm wondering if like, you know, either you wouldn't mind extending the use or Kelly has a different picture. I have different pictures I can give just so that we could like use this uh, more broadly um, with a different picture. What do you think? Yeah, I have no problem with that. Keep in mind, I'm standing on, in Springfield when I took the picture, but I rep, I understand it's a, it's representative of our area. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, I'm fine with additional uses. And since I have the floor for 30 more seconds, yeah. The, the timeline I noticed in one of Kelly's videos, and I just grabbed it and thought, well, this could be something just to continue to add to, you know, over the years and, and obviously have to edit it so it fits on one page. But that would be a good problem to have if you can't fit it all on one page. Yes. <laughs> I mean, this you uh, this uh, for for your capabilities, Lynn, this is so simple. But for us just to get to this point, you know, it's just, you know. We're all volunteer, of course. We all do this just for the good of the community. And so you've given us a really nice starting platform here to just go from here. So much appreciated. Yep. Two two yeah. quick questions on the yep. on the utility flyer. Again, thanks to everybody who pulled it together. It's on the text in the uh packet, it there was something about page one of four. Two of four, which implied there was a three of four and a four of four. Was that just a technical glitch? Yeah, I don't oh. know why it came out like that. Um, okay, so it is just just two. One, yeah, there's one, just day, two. one sheet, two pages. Okay, and the other clarification, uh, Lynn, you're, that the picture above the Middleton Sustainability Committee timeline banner is something you took from where? You said Springfield which could be any state in the country. I'm just... <laughs> well, that's that's Frederick's Mound. And okay, it is. Okay, good. That's what I thought it looked like, but then yeah. I was going, oh, yeah. I hope it's Frederick's otherwise... Yeah, I mean, if you use a zoom lens, you could be standing on the land of Middleton and take that shot, but obviously I'm standing in the parking lot off of Pheasant Branch Road. Um, okay, good. Yeah, that's Frederick's Mound. Excellent. I, and I don't know whether there's any point or way to kind of label it or highlight it that way but if it's too late never mind but uh, it's too late. It's too late oh well <laughs> too late yeah you okay. got yourself a brand well, new we system. know we know now yeah we know. okay i want it we it's a great call it's 8 30 sharp um thank you everyone uh you know the first agenda item or the the uh turf was a long one um so thank you everyone thank you ever, everyone for everything um, and have a good night. Do we have a motion? I think we can just adjourn, but do we have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Lynn, all yep. in favor? Yep. Bye. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank Aye. you, everyone. Aye and bye. 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 bye.